in the U.S., alcohol is the most widely used psychoactive substance after caffeine and in Texas. Roughly half of all citizens in the nation have had a drink at some point in their lives. 44% of those who do drink are binge drinkers, and 12.8% of those who drink are heavy drinkers. With alcohol so much a part of our lives, whether we drink or not, this module is designed to help anyone understand some of the consequences that some people encounter when using alcohol, namely alcohol use disorder. We'll cover how alcohol use disorder is defined, what causes it, and what the symptoms of AUD are, how it is diagnosed, and some complications that may occur. Treatment options available to anyone who wants to decrease or stop their drinking are discussed and some resources are listed for those who need guidance. The objectives of this course are to understand alcohol use disorder by learning the definition of AUD, its prevalence, the biology of alcohol use disorder, and the stigma associated with it. Further, we'll discuss treatment of alcohol use disorder, first covering the idea that there isn't a one-size-fits-all method for dealing with AUD the idea of harm reduction, and a discussion of a variety of treatment types that are available for folks who are dealing with alcohol use disorder. We will discuss some treatment paths that are innovative and go well beyond the 12-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous, which was considered the, quote, gold standard for AUD, and provide information that helps each person who is deciding whether to enter treatment with a menu of available methods to reduce drinking, or to abstain from alcohol use, depending on their own needs. What we now call alcohol use disorder, or AUD, as we'll abbreviate the disorder throughout this presentation, used to be termed alcoholism. But to avoid stigmatizing the person with the disease, we now use the new term. This acknowledges that alcohol use disorder is not seen as a belief or lack of willpower but rather as a disease where the brain has been altered by consumption of alcohol to the point that one or more of the following symptoms occur. Being unable to limit the amount of alcohol you drink. Wanting to cut down on how much you drink or making unsuccessful attempts to do so. Spending a lot of time drinking, getting alcohol, or recovering from alcohol use. Feeling a strong craving or urge to drink alcohol failing to fulfill major obligations at work, school, or home due to repeated alcohol use, continuing to drink alcohol even though you know it's causing physical, social, or interpersonal problems, giving up or reducing social and work activities and hobbies, using alcohol in situations where it's not safe, such as when driving or swimming, developing a tolerance to alcohol so you need more to feel its effect, or you have a reduced effect from the same amount. Experiencing withdrawal symptoms, such as nausea, sweating, and shaking when you don't drink, or drinking to avoid these symptoms. Later, we'll provide a self-assessment to determine if you have AUD and the severity of the disease. Starting on the left, this chart clarifies the name for different types of drinkers what amount that type of drinker consumes, and their risk for developing a problem with their drinking, specifically AUD. Note the high intensity type in red, which is a new term in the research literature for a person who consumes 10 or more drinks in two hours. This new designation is still not finalized, but is now used to capture data about this emerging level of alcohol consumption. Compared with people who did not binge drink, people who drank alcohol at twice the gender-specific binge drinking thresholds were 70 times more likely to have an alcohol-related emergency department visit. And those who consumed alcohol at three times the gender-specific binge thresholds were 93 times more likely to visit the ED. Gray area drinking is an informal term used to describe the loosely defined area between social drinking and those with alcohol use disorder. This level of alcohol use provides those who are troubled by their own drinking a way to compare their drinking to those at higher risk and to contemplate a drink reduction strategy 
or to become abstinent before they develop AUD. Here is another way to measure risk from drinking from the World Health Organization. Recently, reduction treatment goals, based on the risk levels shown here in different colors, are used by people who choose not to become abstinent. Reducing the amount of alcohol used may be a more obtainable goal than not drinking at all, and thus engage more people in treatment and has gained attention as a viable treatment option. According to the researchers, quote, this metric also has clinical utility since reducing alcohol consumption by one or two WHO risk drinking levels leads to significant physical, psychological, and emotional improvement as shown by new research. This method can be used in a harm reduction strategy for folks who aren't ready to become abstinent, but recognize that their current level of drinking is causing them difficulty. In 2020, 50% of people aged 12 and older, or about 138.5 million people, used alcohol in the past month. In other words, were current alcohol users. Among those current alcohol users, 61.6 million people, or 44.4%, were classified as binge drinkers, and 17.7 million people, or 28.8% of current binge drinkers, and 12.8% of current alcohol users, were classified as heavy drinkers. The percentage of people who were past month binge alcohol users was highest among young adults aged 18 to 25 at 31.4%, compared with adults aged 26 or older at 22.9%, and to adolescents aged 12 to 17 at 4.1%, who were past month binge alcohol users. Moving to the state level, Texans consume 2.31 gallons of alcohol per year, on average per year for Texans 14 and older in 2017. 51.6% of Texans had a drink in the last month of adults who self-reported drinking alcohol in 2018. 17.4% reported binge drinking. That is four drinks per occasion for females and five drinks per occasion for males. 6.2% reported heavy drinking, which was quantified as eight drinks per week for females and 15 drinks per week for males. In Texas, 13,592 people were killed in crashes involving an alcohol-impaired driver from 2009 to 2018. The background on this is it's illegal to drive in our state with a blood alcohol content at or above 0.08%. Publicized sobriety checkpoints are not allowed. Ignition interlocks are required for all, including first-time convicted offenders. For people under 21, zero-tolerance laws make it illegal to drive with any measurable amount of alcohol in their systems. Still, alcohol-impaired drivers get behind the wheel millions of times each year. More than 10,000 people in the United States die each year in crashes that involve an alcohol-impaired driver. Those who identify as white, American Indian, Alaska Native, and then Latinx have the highest rates of issues with alcohol, respectively. An estimate of alcohol use in 2019 among people aged 12 or older was highest for white people, at 70.3%, compared with the estimates for people in all other racial ethnic groups, followed by the estimate for people reporting two or more races at 61.4%. This was higher than Hispanic people at 58.7%, or for Blacks at 56.8%, American Indian at 53.2%, or Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islanders at 52.7%. Asian people had the lowest estimate of past year alcohol use at 51.7%. And here you can see the alcohol use in the past year for folks aged 12 or older by race, ethnicity, and gender. Note that males are denoted in blue and females in red, and these data are annual averages collected between 2015 and 2019. Prevalence rates of drinking for boys and girls are similar in the younger age groups. However, among older adolescents, more boys than girls engage in frequent and heavy drinking, 
and boys show higher rates of drinking problems. The NIAAA, or National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, a part of the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, finds that alcohol is the drug of choice among youth. Many young people are experiencing the consequences of drinking too much at too early an age. As a result, underage drinking is a leading public health problem in this country. Each year, approximately 5,000 young people under the age of 21 die as a result of underage drinking. This includes about 1,900 deaths from motor vehicle crashes, 1,600 as a result of homicides, 300 from suicide, as well as hundreds from other injuries such as falls, burns, and drownings. Yet drinking continues to be widespread among adolescents, as shown by nationwide surveys, as well as studies in smaller populations. Although the legal drinking age in the U.S. is 21, most people began drinking earlier, according to Caetano and his colleagues. The authors continue, there is a positive association between age at first drink and a variety of alcohol-related outcomes. Most people begin drinking before they turn 21, the legal drinking age in the U.S. Drinking at early ages substantially increases risk for lifetime, current, and recurrent alcohol use disorders. For example, those drinking before age 14 are three times more likely to binge drink, that is, consume five or more drinks in a day, at least once a week, than those who began after age 21. Among people 12 to 49 years of age who began drinking in the past 12 months, the average age at first drink was 17.1 years. Among those 12 and older who began drinking before age 21, the average age at first drink was 15.9 years. Among the 4.7 million people who began drinking in the past 12 months during 2011, 82.9% began drinking before age 21, and 61% began drinking before age 18. People who began drinking before age 14 have a 47% higher rate of alcohol dependence across their lifetime and a 13% higher rate for dependence in the past year. Compared among those who started drinking after age 20, where there is only a 9% lifetime rate and a 2% rate of alcohol dependence in the past year. If you start drinking between ages 15 and 17, you have an increased incidence of adult alcohol abuse for both men and women, an increased incidence of dependence for women only. Remember, dependence is a change in the chemistry of the brain that is accompanied by craving for drinks that contain alcohol and the inability to control the amount of alcohol consumed, along with continued use despite repeated problems caused by drinking. You also have a risk for impaired executive function. Early experiences in drunkenness, in particular, also predict later problems with behaviors among adolescents. Teen drinking affects the brain, impacting long-term thinking and memory skills, elevates liver enzymes as found in some adolescents who drink, indicating some degree of liver damage, and may upset the critical hormonal balance necessary for normal development of organs, muscles, and bones. Drinking may also adversely affect the maturation of the reproductive system. People drink for several reasons, including to enhance sociability, to increase power, to escape problems, to get drunk, for enjoyment, or for ritualistic reasons. Scientists have broken these reasons into two major groups, negative reinforcement, that is personal effects motives, also called drinking to cope or positive reinforcement, which are social effects motives, also called drinking to be sociable. Abby, Smith, and Scott in 1993 found that both social and coping motives for consuming alcohol can lead to heavy drinking. Addiction to alcohol has two core effects on the person with alcohol use disorder. One, an enhanced desire or motivational drive to continue use. This includes cravings to drink or the inability to stop drinking once started. And two, a weakening of cognitive control as seen in the decreasing visuospatial abilities of someone who is drinking, such as the decreased ability to drive a car. This is also seen in the decline of higher cognitive functioning, such as the abstract thinking capabilities 
needed to organize a plan, set it in motion, and change it as needed. Deficits, or inabilities in response inhibition, for example, predict alcohol and drug use in humans and in animal models of drug addiction. The serotonergic system plays an important role in action withholding and deferring gratification. Those with deficits in this area demonstrate that immediate gratification is preferred over delayed advantages in terms of better outcomes or avoiding punishment. This is called nearsightedness for the future and is usually seen in patients with frontal lobe damage. The definition of addiction, according to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, is, in a quote, addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases, end quote. A link to the society's information can be found in the course. The frontal lobes control emotions and impulses normally communicated to the hippocampus, which regulates memory of previous drinking episodes, as well as memory of other drugs, sex, and food by way of neurotransmitters which affect the reward circuits of the brain. These reward circuits encourage us to pursue life-sustaining activities like eating. Alcohol, by way of changes to neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, which allow the communication from the hippocampus to the frontal lobes, alter biological and behavioral responses to external cues, which in turn trigger craving and or engagement in addictive behaviors such as continued drinking. Changes in motivation and memory due to frequent alcohol use alter impulse control, judgment, and result in a dysfunctional pursuit of rewards. In other words, people with alcohol use disorder, despite repeated negative events occurring because of alcohol use, continue to use alcohol to achieve the effects they are seeking. Serotonin, one of the neurotransmitters, has receptors on nerve cells that convert the chemical signal produced by serotonin into functional changes in the signal receiving cell in nerve pathways. Serotonin, along with another neurotransmitter called dopamine, provide alcohol's intoxicating and rewarding effects. Serotonin elevates the mood, and dopamine provides feelings of pleasure and reward. Drugs that act on these serotonin receptors on nerve pathways in the brain alter alcohol consumption in both humans and animals. Consumption of large quantities of alcohol causes differences in the brain's serotonin levels compared to those without alcohol use disorder. Abnormalities in the brain's serotonin system appear to play an important role in alcohol abuse. Alcohol affects both gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA, and glutamate, affecting receptors and the transmission of both neurotransmitters mediating alcohol's behaviors and cognitive effects and likely plays an important role in the development of alcohol dependence. During acute intoxication, excess gabatone, increased release or greater receptor effects, is related to sedation, anti-anxiety, anti-seizure, as well as coordination and cognitive impairment effects. During acute withdrawal, on the other hand, Excess glutamate tone is related to stimulation, anxiety, cognitive disorganization, and seizures. Excessive alcohol use has immediate effects that increase the risk of many harmful health conditions. These are most often the result of binge or heavy drinking and include the following. Injuries such as motor vehicle crashes, falls, drownings, and burns. Violence, including homicide, suicide, sexual assault, and intimate partner violence. Alcohol poisoning, a medical emergency that results from high blood alcohol levels. Risky sexual behaviors, including unprotected sex or sex with multiple partners. These behaviors can result in an unintended pregnancy or sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV. Miscarriage and stillbirth among pregnant women or fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or FASD 
for the children they bear. Over time, excessive alcohol use can lead to the development of chronic diseases and other serious problems, including high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, and digestive problems, cancer of the breast, mouth, throat, esophagus, voice box, liver, colon, and rectum, weakening of the immune system, increasing the chances of getting sick, learning and memory problems, including dementia and poor school performance, mental health problems, including depression and anxiety, social problems, including family problems, job-related problems, and unemployment, and alcohol use disorder or alcohol dependence. Assessments for AUD are usually performed by a mental or a medical health care professional, but self-assessments are available. If a self-assessment score causes you concern, seek out help from a medical or counseling professional. Assessing whether you have AUD is based on an 11 question questionnaire from the DSM-5, Criteria for Alcohol Use Disorder from the American Psychiatric Association, developed in 2013, or the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test, called AUDIT, which is a 10-item screening tool developed by the World Health Organization, also called the WHO, to assess alcohol consumption, drinking behaviors, and alcohol-related problems. As the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5th Edition, or DSM-5, illuminates, the criteria for diagnosing AUD is based on the answers to 11 questions. AUD is diagnosed if two of the 11 symptoms are present. Two to three symptoms is considered mild. Four to five is considered moderate. And more than six symptoms is considered severe AUD. A diagnosis of AUD can only be made by a medical professional. Here's the quick four-question CAGE test, which stands for Cut Down, Annoyed, Guilty, Eye Opener. This test consists of the following yes or no questions. Have you ever felt you should cut down on your drinking? Have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking? Have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? Eye opener. Have you ever had a drink first thing in the morning to steady your nerves? Two or more yes answers may indicate AUD. A diagnosis of AUD can only be made by a medical professional. One of several online audit self-assessments is provided by the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the link shown. This self-assessment features the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test called AUDIT, which is a 10-item screening tool developed by the World Health Organization, or WHO, to assess alcohol consumption, drinking behaviors, and alcohol-related problems. This self-assessment allows you to evaluate your responses and provides a score and relates that score to a risk for developing problems with alcohol. A score of eight or more is considered to indicate hazardous or harmful alcohol use according to the guidelines. A diagnosis of AUD can only be made by a medical professional. A clickable link will also be available to course. There are some people who should not drink any alcohol, including those who are younger than 21, pregnant or may be pregnant, driving, planning to drive, or participating in other activities requiring skill, coordination, and alertness, taking certain prescription or over-the-counter meds that can interfere with alcohol, suffering from certain medical conditions, or are recovering from alcohol use disorder, or are unable to control the amount they drink. A recent article in Health by Maggie Downs identified gray area drinking as a hard to define area between moderate social drinking and AUD. Down cites Annie Green, who asks, why are you drinking in the first place? If you answer yes to any of the following questions, you might want to try sobriety. Are you stressed out or anxious? Do you have a drink to relax? Do you have a hard time enjoying your life without alcohol? Down suggests not getting caught up in tons of quizzes. Instead, answer the question, would I be happier drinking a bit less? Gray area drinking is an informal term that describes that area between moderate social drinking and AUD. It is not an easily defined area, but allows introspection. That is, it allows people to assess what direction their drinking is taking and to make changes while it is easier to accomplish. 
If you do decide to stop drinking, you may feel very emotional for two to three weeks. This is because alcohol suppresses the release of the neurotransmitter glutamate, resulting in slowed thoughts, motor skills, speech, and energy levels. Alcohol floods the brain with dopamine, making you feel buzzed. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that allows you to feel pleasure, mood, and motivation. In response to repeated dopamine release, the brain shuts down some of the receptors to balance the levels of dopamine affecting the nervous system. The euphoria felt when you first drink, caused by the dopamine release, is thus reduced, leading people to drink more drinks or to drink more frequently to achieve the same effect. This is dependence. After your brain has been acclimated to a regular supply of alcohol, your brain resets itself and how it processes information accommodating for the regular alcohol intake. When you stop drinking, your brain again resets and you may experience alcohol withdrawal, including the shakes, confusion, anger, disorientation, and irritability. Even low to moderate drinkers may experience sleep disturbance or anxiety. This brain reset can take two to three weeks and may be accompanied by emotional changes that may be difficult to deal with. During this time of beginning abstinence, the brain volume lost due to alcohol use begins to increase as demonstrated in MRI studies of those in recovery. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, defines recovery as a process of change to improve health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach your full potential. SAMHSA has identified four dimensions of recovery from substance abuse like AUD. Number one, health, overcoming or managing one's diseases or symptoms. For example, abstaining from the use of alcohol if one has an addiction problem. And for everyone in recovery, making informed, healthy choices that support physical and emotional well-being. Number two, home, having a stable and safe place to live. Number three, purpose, participating in meaningful daily activities and having the independence, income, and resources to participate in society. And finally, community, engaging in relationships and social networks that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. Because there is currently no cure for alcohol use disorder, recovery is a lifetime process. There is a concept in dealing with substance and alcohol use disorder called harm reduction. SAMHSA defines this as a well-researched and practical way to reduce the effects of alcohol use in ways that benefit individuals, their families, and their communities. Watch the video to hear about the evolution of harm reduction, how harm reduction strategies help, and acknowledge that there is more than one path to reducing the harm from alcohol use or drug use. The takeaway about harm reduction is that each person who is dealing with a substance or alcohol use disorder should have autonomy, that is, the right to choose their treatment method or even if they choose to receive any treatment. For example, if someone chooses no treatment at this time and receives acceptance and understanding of their decision, this encourages and engages them because it preserves their right to decide what they can or want to do. In other words, their autonomy is respected. If they choose no treatment at this time, they know that treatment, where they are allowed to make decisions about their care, exists. And when they are ready for the next step on the road to recovery, a non-judgmental and supportive place exists for their care. Further, if they can't be abstinent, then they can work on drink reduction. There are many paths toward recovery or increasing sobriety. Self-motivated sobriety is based on the concept of an individual deciding to become sober and quitting based on their own desire or motivation to do so. This may be combined with helpful strategies such as communal living arrangements, with like-minded individuals who are also in recovery, called sober living homes. Use of 12-step programs or alternatives to 12-step programs may also be used to help with sobriety. Taking medication for alcohol use disorder is like taking medication to treat any other medical condition. 
It is not substituting one drug for another. Used properly, medication does not create a new addiction. Using medication in combination with counseling and behavior therapies to treat alcohol use disorder and sustain recovery is a method of treatment which has proven effective for helping patients with moderate to severe AUD. If a person needs to drink more to feel the effects of alcohol, needs to drink to prevent withdrawal symptoms, has cravings or urges to drink excessively, and has not improved in response to psychosocial approaches such as therapy, counseling, or mutual aid groups alone, they are particularly strong candidates for medication-assisted treatment. Medication-assisted treatment uses medication in combination with counseling and behavior therapies to treat alcohol use disorder and sustain recovery. Medications can help to regain a stable state of mind, free from alcohol-induced highs and lows, provide freedom from thinking about alcohol all the time, reduce problems of craving, and focus on lifestyle changes that lead back to healthy living. Four drugs are FDA approved for AUD. A compensate is for people in recovery who are no longer drinking alcohol and want to avoid drinking. It works to prevent people from drinking alcohol, but it does not prevent withdrawal symptoms after people drink. Second is disulfiram. This causes unpleasant side effects, nausea, headache, vomiting, chest pains, and difficulty breathing. And these can occur as soon as 10 minutes after drinking even a small amount of alcohol and can last for an hour or more. Naltrexone provides the greatest benefit in patients who can discontinue drinking on their own for several days before starting the drug. Naltrexone oral is the third type of medication that are FDA approved, and this blocks the euphoric effects and feelings of intoxication and allows people with alcohol use disorders to reduce alcohol use and to remain motivated to continue the medication, stay in treatment, and avoid relapses. Fourth is naltrexone long-acting injectable. This is for patients who've been able to abstain from alcohol in an outpatient setting, ideally for four or more days. This long-acting shot helps patients remain abstinent because it prevents the good feelings from drinking and doesn't have to be taken daily. Only 1.6 of the estimated 14.1 million adults with past year alcohol use disorder, that's only 223,000 of 14 million people, use medications for treating AUD. This is 2019 data. Another path to recovery is available from Alcoholics Anonymous which is a self-help group for people recovering from AUD. AA offers a sober peer group and is built around 12 steps as an effective model for achieving total abstinence. Al-Anon is designed for people who are affected by someone else's AUD. al and adult children of alcoholics groups are available for teenage and adult children of those with AUD. In sharing their stories, family members gain a greater understanding of how the disease affects the entire family. Alcoholics Anonymous, or AA, is essentially a support group for individuals in recovery from AUD. AA helps individuals to connect with others who also struggle with addiction to form a network of peers working toward the same goal, sustained sobriety in recovery. Individuals are able to work together to achieve this common goal and support each other through potential stressors therefore helping to reduce episodes of relapse. It can be highly beneficial to have someone to lean on who has already been there, who can offer insight, hope, and strength. AA is based on the 12-step doctrine that asks members to admit their lack of control over alcohol. In order to recover, individuals are asked to turn themselves over to a higher power and find a spiritual awakening. While this concept may be very helpful for many people, for others, the spiritual aspect of AA may not be ideal. Even though AA is not based on a specific religion, the 12-step model does have religious or at least spiritual undertones. A short list of alternatives to 12-step programs includes LifeRing, which is a secular, that's non-religious, peer support network supporting abstinence from alcohol and other drugs. Visit the LifeRing website to learn more and to find an in-person or online meeting. Another alternative may be found at Secular Organizations for Sobriety. 
an alternative to spiritual support groups. This is a network of local and online groups dedicated to helping people achieve and maintain sobriety. Visit Secular Organizations for Sobriety to learn more. Smart Recovery is a research-based support program that focuses on empowering members to build four sets of skills, motivation to abstain, coping with urges, problem solving, and lifestyle balance. Visit Smart Recovery to learn more and find an in-person or online meeting. Women for Sobriety is a specialized self-help group designed by women and for women, focusing on emotional and spiritual growth. Visit Women for Sobriety to learn more and find a meeting and an online message board. In addition to support groups, people in recovery should also maintain a connection with their treatment counselor. While mutual help support groups are an excellent source of support and encouragement, they are usually not run by professional clinicians. Some issues may require the help of a trained healthcare professional. Counseling is used as standalone treatment by referral to a psychiatrist, psychologist, or professional counselor to address issues arising from AUD. Counseling is also used as a part of other treatment methods, including medications for alcohol use disorder and as additional support while participating in a mutual help program such as AA or alternatives to AA. Why do some people develop AUD and why don't others? As you've probably heard before, it's due to nature from such things as your genetics, whether you have a tendency towards depression and how you metabolize alcohol, but it's also nurture such as easy access, age of your first drink, peer drinking, and media and advertising. Let's break that down so you can see how each of these contributes to a greater risk for developing AUD. Some specific genetic factors may make people more likely to develop an addiction to alcohol and other substances. So genetics may contribute to a family history of AUD. The age of the first alcoholic drink contributes to the risk as we've seen, studies suggest that people who start drinking alcohol before the age of 15 years of age may be more likely to have problems with alcohol later in life. There appears to be a correlation between easy access to alcohol, such as cheap prices, and alcohol misuse and alcohol-related deaths. One study registered a significant drop in alcohol-related deaths after one state raised alcohol taxes. Raising taxes on alcohol was found to be nearly two to four times more effective than other prevention strategies such as school programs or media campaigns. People whose friends, that is their peers, who drink regularly or excessively are also more likely to drink too much. This can eventually lead to alcohol-related problems. Some stress hormones are linked to alcohol misuse. If stress and anxiety levels are high, a person may consume alcohol an attempt to blank out the upheaval. Those with low self-esteem who have alcohol readily available are more likely to consume too much. People with depression may deliberately or unwittingly use alcohol as a means of self-treatment. Counterproductively, consuming too much alcohol may increase the risk for depression rather than reducing it. In some countries, alcohol is portrayed as a glamorous, worldly, and cool activity. Alcohol advertising and media coverage of alcohol may increase the risk by conveying the message that excessive drinking is acceptable. How the body processes or metabolizes alcohol may cause some people to need comparatively more alcohol to achieve any effect. Because more alcohol is used, these folks have a higher risk of eventually developing health problems related to alcohol. Stigma refers to negative beliefs about individuals or groups based on characteristics that may set them apart from others, such as mental health conditions, including alcohol use disorder or AUD. Stigma can exacerbate AUD by contributing to a person's negative emotional states that drive AUD and by deterring people with AUD from seeking treatment. You can reduce stigma and encourage patients to seek AUD treatment by conveying that AUD is a health condition with effective, evidence-backed treatments that can be delivered on an outpatient basis, preserving patient routines and privacy. Research has shown that close contact with an individual with a psychiatric disorder reduces fear of mental illness, 
which in turn reduces stigma and advises that programs focused on the reduction of stigma of alcohol disorders may increase help-seeking behavior among individuals with alcohol disorders. What causes stigma for patients with AUD? In population surveys, several reasons people cite for not seeking treatment for AUD relate to stigma, such as too embarrassed to discuss it with anyone and should be strong enough to handle it alone and concerned that others might have a negative opinion. Qualitative research digs deeper, finding that patients living with AUD report the following. Shame. Many patients view AUD and its treatment as shameful, a personal failure, or a blow to self-esteem. Identity issues. When people realize they have AUD and need treatment for it, they can face a troubling change in identity. They may internalize society's negative stereotypical views of people with AUD. Lack of knowledge about treatment. People may be aware only of treatment options that may be unappealing to them. These options may include residential treatment, which could interfere with work or home life and be a barrier to confidentiality, or the use of an older AUD medication, such as disulfiram, that causes very unpleasant effects when alcohol is consumed, and a perceived need for lifelong abstinence. They might prefer options that offer more flexibility and autonomy, but are unaware that such choices do exist. Flo Hillard writes about her own AUD recovery and her educational efforts. Quote, the powerful story of what happens in the brain as addiction develops and how that creates the oftentimes illogical and negative behavior of those with SUDs, that is substance use disorders, including AUD. This education is imperative to eliminate stigma and the concept that addiction is a choice or a moral failing. Hillard continues, quote, in order to destroy addiction stigma once and for all, we need to educate on the three dimensions. One, addiction is a disease or medical condition. Two, addiction is the same as other chronic lifestyle diseases in its development. And three, stigmatizing language must be challenged and changed. Please see our additional modules on culturally competent care that address stigma one about communities facing stigma, and the other for leaders. They can be found at go.uth.edu slash heroes training. Caring for a person who has problems with alcohol can be very stressful. It is important that as you try to help your loved one, you find a way to take care of yourself as well. It may help to seek support from others, including friends, family, community, and support groups. Remember that your loved one is ultimately responsible for managing his or her illness. However, your participation can make a big difference. Based on clinical experience, many health providers believe that support from friends and family members is important in overcoming alcohol problems. But friends and family may feel unsure how to provide the support needed. The groups for family and friends listed may be a good starting point. Remember that changing deep habits is hard, takes time, and requires repeated efforts. We usually experience failures along the way, learn from them, and then keep going. AUD is no different. Try to be patient with your loved one. Overcoming this disorder is neither easy or quick. Pay attention to your loved one when he or she is doing better or simply making an effort. Too often, we are so angry or discouraged that we take it for granted when things are going better. A word of appreciation or acknowledgement of a simple success can go a long way. Help is available if you or someone you love or know is struggling with AUD. An easy way to see where you stand is available via the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test. SAMHSA, or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, may be contacted at samsa.gov or 800-662-4357. For all first responders and healthcare workers in Texas, please call the HEROES Helpline at 833-367-4689 or reach out online at heroeshelpline.org or visit our virtual lobby at go.uth.edu slash text heroes helpline.